Thank you again for such a fantastic film. It's always great to see. No, he doesn't need a light. It's, we need uh, a bit wonderful. more light on John. In fact, it... Oh, um, I don't want to blind you guys, but oh, I can okay. turn it up a bit. But yeah, it's OK. Yeah. Congratulations on the projection too. I thought with the except for the some moments toward the end where we had a bit of artifacting. But um, apart from that it looked really wonderful. It was great. It's not it's not bad but I'd get yeah, I want a better I want a better a better one. <laughs> if one always wants a better well, one. Well one of the distinctive qualities of the film on a formal level is that it was made on thirty five millimeter, which we're talking about outside. Unusual for the independent film at that time, which was usually sixteen mil. Could you tell us how and why that came about? Um, I guess I thought that um, because our ratio was going to be low and we shot, Nicolette correct me if I'm wrong, but we shot on about four to one, didn't we? She's not going to correct me. Pardon? I don't remember. You don't remember. Um, that means we shot four times as much film, four hours of film to one hour of film. So, you know, the stock budget wasn't going to be high comp comparatively, right? That was one reason. And, but I mean, the aesthetic reason was to do with I wanted to get it into cinemas. But more than that, I wanted it because there wasn't a lot going on on the vision track except for these stills, essentially. I mean, there's some camera movement, but, you know, there's not not much performance or anything by actors. All right, there's quite a bit going on in the soundtrack. But yeah, I mean, if you're gonna hold people in one room for an hour, I thought the images had to be strong. Mm. And you would get more detail in 35 mil, which we did. Yeah, mm. well, I think it works, it works incredibly yeah. well. And you know, some people at the AFC, as I said, argued against it and said it could have been done on eight mil, but we just, mm sort of argued, argued it wasn't going to cost a lot really, so why not, you know, and, mm. and as it was, we did shoot on short ends and stuff like that, so it was even cheaper, you know. Yes, the short ends idea was something that I, I always admired a lot about that film. Yes, it was I good. thought it was a, a beautiful part of the treatment idea to take that... Um, yeah, we scrounged, yeah. you know, off features. The detritus that from the feature and turned yeah. it into this... <laughs> To an this new film. After you left, I moved in here for a year, hoping that the view would pull me out of the misery. Maybe it did. And there was nowhere else to live, except alone. And lonely, without you. One of the things the film does, um, also in an unusual way or to a particular extent, is it invites the collaboration of others in a certain way. It's kind of, it's very open in that way. It, it, it constructs a spectator who is, who is uh, curious and is continually looking and searching for material. In the shot. In, in yeah. the shot and in the relationship between the voice and in the ideas that are being presented. And uh, so you've spoken about working with Elizabeth and with Nicolette. Mm -hmm. But can you say something about working with Jan McKay, Mackay, Mackay, mm -hmm. Mackay, and um, Erica. with Erica? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll talk about Jan first. She had a shoestring budget. Um, it's a couple of, at the most, it was four hundred dollars. I think it was just ridiculous. Um, but she, you know, she just dragged out of everybody and herself and everywhere she could um, props and whatever was needed. Um, and another thing that I guess she and Erica both insisted was that the walls were all painted a like grey card grey, so that um, anything against them would be easy 
to expose. So the whole flat was painted. Um, so that I'm not explaining this very well. Cinematographers in the room might understand, but it, it means that the background is sort of sitting in the middle of the range of exposure. Okay. Um, so it wasn't going black or it wasn't burning out to white or whatever. Um, and it made all the images richer, I think, as a result, because you could set the exposure. I think, look, I don't even remember how, is this right, Nicolette, now? It's quite a long time ago. <laughs> Am I, is my logic right? Um, I think my logic's right. And um, so that was Erica insisting on that, but Jan was in that conversation. Hmm. Um, and I mean, Jan herself is a fantastic artist and um, poster maker and printmaker and um, yeah, she was, she was just always, you know, fiddling, looking through the lens, trying to, you know, work out, getting, running off and getting things we needed or what have you. Yeah. So the mezzanine scene is very, very, very collaborative. Yeah. And, and Did you uh, storyboard the film? Yeah, I'll come, I'll come back to that after okay. I talk about Erica because what Erica did was She's tough on me, you know. Um, I mean, it's basically nine scenes, I think. And um, she said, all right, you know, I want a colour for each scene. Now, that may not be apparent to you, and it's not meant to be apparent, but in a sense, it was like... Yeah, it's like, what is the colour feeling of this scene? What, what colours might we see in it? What, you know... Um, so she insisted that I work that out. Um, and yes, I did a storyboard. Um, I had those sort of sketch pad books and I sort of pasted down the, well, I'd do a picture and then I'd paste down the bit of voiceover on the other side that was to go with that picture. And there were actually seven books of these sketchbooks that make the storyboard. I mean, it's not the right way to do a storyboard. I know, you know, that I since know. Um, I knew then probably, but yeah, I mean, storyboards <coughs> are more for working out how one shot will cut with another, which was less of an issue in this film, but um, it worked for me. Mm, yeah. sure. I, I can't draw for... Have we still got these books? Do yes, they still we do. They them? still exist, That's yes. <laughs> Yesterday. Steve's party. Jenny there, of course. I ended up wailing in the street and he kept smashing his hand into the wall as if he were about to break it. And I knew I was the wall. Someone asked him the other day if we'd ever had good times in the years we were on together and he told me that he honestly had to tell them no. He couldn't remember one good time. He said he was sure this would feed my self-hatred or whatever it was. Us getting in two punches for the price of one. Can you tell us a bit about the reception of the film mm -hmm. and that, this question of the mid-80s, the Sydney feminist work, f film workers and so on, um, and the international reception, how the, how the kind of uh, sensibility that's being articulated and the arguments that are being raised yeah. was dealt it with? It never got time. a great international run. Uh, you know, it, it showed at Edinburgh and was nice review and guess what David Byrne was in the audience from Talking Heads here's my little anecdote about that I'll just I'll just divert <laughs> briefly but um, there's a sort of area where filmmakers have coffee um, Edinburgh's not that big a festival like it, you know well then it was, it was, it was I mean it's a prestigious it's festival, festival yeah, yeah but it, it's a you know, the cinemas aren't that big and there's a couple of them and anyway there's a coffee area where filmmakers mill around and I'm there and I'm thinking I recognise that face. I can't work out who it is, you know. Oh, maybe it's someone from Melbourne. <laughs> anyway, and then suddenly the penny dropped, you know. So I had to go to the toilet um, and sort of work out what I would say to him. And then oh. I went. Then I went, Then I came back and fronted him and and um, said, "Oh, I don't know how we got into conversation, but anyway, uh, are you here with your film?" Is usually the opening gambit. And um, he was, and he talked about that. And and then you know, are you here with your film? But anyway, no, I'd worked out what to say to him, which was that I used, um, is it Stop Making Sense? That, um, yep. Because 
I use it to teach students lighting oh. because it starts with just one light and the transistor radio or whatever on this and then it builds up to two lights and oh. three lights and then he's got lights swinging around and then he's got lit backgrounds and it just gets more complex uh, song after song. It's a, co it's a concert film or a, it's a film of an album. Um, anyway, and then he said, oh, you know, that he'd just seen my film. <laughs> I nearly fell through the floor. Anyway, he said... I was, he said, I thought it was a diary film and then I saw the credits and re re realised it was constructed and, you know, I liked that. Mm -hmm. um, but your question is about the reception. I had a look, I tried to get international distributors, no go, but it did headline a, a women's film festival in Edmonton, Canada. That was the opening night film. Um, and that was very nice. They were very nice to me, and it w went down well. Um, it was funny. In I mean, it ha it had a sorry, it had a cinema run with um, Ross Gibson's film uh, Cameron Natura. Cameron Natura, Cameron Natura. Thank you. And at one point, with two other Ned Weatherard and something else, uh, Lee Whitmore's film. Anyway, The Lead Dress was okay. the other film. Um, two animations basically um, and yeah it did reasonably well like it ran for a week in most states you know and and people went to it and in was reasonable numbers you know was there a debate no i seem to remember yeah it being no, this comes being like highly contentious it's yeah, just one of the really <coughs> interesting things about the film that it, yeah, it generated it was, anxiety yeah there wasn't <laughs> a, in sydney there wasn't a debate but i remember coming out of the den some people in the dendy screening walked out um and not many but a few enough to worry you sitting there you know um mm -hmm. And when I came out, and I'm not going to name names here, but one of my feminist friends just sort of looked at me and said, I hated it, you know. Wow. And, yes. and um, <laughs> I, you know, I grabbed Denise, the editor, and said, let's just go to Hyde Park, you know, let's just get out of here. And mm. we did. Um, I found that very upsetting. Um, was she a friend? Yes, yeah, she's a friend so of a filmmaker. She's a friend and a feminist yeah, filmmaker, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll tell John later who it was. Um, he may know. And, um, we could have a competition. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the correct, correct answer will be yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll receive the second book of drawings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or at least a copy. Um, then, um, but apart from that, the reception in Sydney was good, and, you know, my feminist friends liked it. Um, but in Melbourne, now I've got to remember a name, well-known film critic, writes on horror. Barbara, Barbara Creed. Creed. Barbara Creed. Came out of the screening, and I know Sue's here, but Alison's not, no? Um, and and uh, Alison Tilson, who was one of the script editors, and I have to thank the script editors, there were three, but um, who all worked different, I mean, they all worked together, as it were. Um, said, did you see that? That was the most disgusting thing I've seen. <laughs> you know, sort of the worst film I've ever seen or something like that. And Alison said, oh, that's interesting. I was one of the script editors, you know. <laughs> I think it's pretty good, you know, or whatever she said. But, mm. um, but anyway, this then, she, there was a pretty bad review by her? No, by someone else in cinema papers. Um titled his story oh. um, like history his story yeah, yeah. Um, and I look I can't, you should be call, called the images Margaret Preston ish sort of domestic images as if that was an insult yay Margaret Preston oh. um, I consider that a compliment sure. but anyway um, and then I uh, went on to sort of say that it was sort of all about the man. I think the real issue was that it showed masochistic behaviour and that, and, and what I now think about that is that that's the sort of liberal feminist position about filmmaking, that you should only show um, female characters who are role models mm. for women, um, mm. in which case you'd never have any femme noir or neo-noir where you've got two women as the protagonist and one as the femme fatale, you'd never have um, women murdering anybody, you'd never have um, 
there's a lot of films you would never have that are quite, you would never have horror for, you know like well I don't, I don't know maybe you would but it, it I've encountered this position off and on since I didn't wasn't aware of it then right. but but I think okay. that's what it's about it's like feminists will only make films where women are like good role models for what like what is that film about the woman who plays the um, who w plays the real woman who was fighting against environmental poisoning? Oh, yeah. Silkwood. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, that's an example. But Erin yeah. Brockovich. Like that's a good right. feminist film in their view, and I think it is too. But um, it's a particular sort of film. I think that's what it's about. I think that was the real problem. I think it was about also well it was suggested by Barbara Creed at one point at something she wrote. I think the the, the issue yeah. was whether. What we were dealing with was a, um, a, a, a celebration and immersion yeah. of masochism or an analysis of, ma of, uh, of masochism or, an, or a, yeah. an analysis of grief. But it, I must say that the thing that kept coming back to me was we saw Julian Murray's performance of A Year of Magical Thinking the other day. Yeah. And this has enormous resonance with that. Right. And I mean, I, I, admittedly, that, that poster that's so sardonic in it, pr probably only seen, and not always easily seen on the 35 mil print, but the way to a woman's heart is through her masochism. Yes. It's like, right. excuse me, I mean, <coughs> it's discussed, it's dealt with, it's sent up, it's um, within the film. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the same time as dwelt in, you know. Yeah. Well, the, spec the speculative dialogue mm. is also... Uh, articulating a critique. Yeah. Beth says I dwell on my injuries and elaborate them out of proportion. I exaggerate the hurts. I read this today. People don't want to be healed. They want a nice juicy wound that will show well when they put neon lights around it. And I read this. Who said that time heals all wounds? It would be better to say that time heals everything except wounds. With time, the hurt of separation loses its real limits. With time, the desired body will soon disappear, and if the desiring body has already ceased to exist for the other, then what remains is a wound, disembodied. Well, what I was thinking in relation to that masochism is that I was thinking because the film is so slow and there seems to be so much time that we definitely get the sense of sort of time passing and there being space for those kind of feelings without actually indulging them. I felt, I felt like we were moving through these spaces and watching and sort of experiencing what was happening but I thought because of the actual filmmaking style and, um, and particularly the lack of music as well and the sound and things that it actually gave space for those feelings without it seemed to me indulging them. Because you've got this feeling moving through them rather than <coughs> in them. Mm. And everybody, that's Elizabeth and it, um, who did the music. And um, it, it was in our discussion that we decided to use, not music on the whole, but natural sounds and to build up I mean, Denise and I did a lot of that work. But and I think I think we were both really interested in music concrete and the way yeah. that the way the music has a <coughs> meaning outside of the source, or if it isn't just to locate something in the image, it's yeah. to actually convey more than that. So I feel the whole sense of the film didn't feel like it was masochistic. Last night I saw you on the street. And my heart fell at my feet I can't help it if I'm still in love with you Somebody else was by your side And she looked so satisfied I can't help it if I'm still in love with you One of the things I, I wondered whether to to what extent the um, the sensibility that's articulated in the film remains contemporary? Mm. Yeah, well, I'd like to know. Is, <laughs> any young people here? What do they feel? Uh, well, I did just say um, that it felt like really relevant, like um, to me personally, um, and um, 
because I was three when this was made. So, oh, wow. Well. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, and, like, it, it didn't feel like it aged or anything. It's still, like, uh, obviously everyone goes through these experiences, you know, regardless of the time period. So, cool. um, yeah. Thank you. I must say that, you know, not so much just recently, but most of the time since I've made it, from time to time someone will come up to me or meet me and say, oh, you know, I saw your film, oh, it had such a big impact on me, you know, oh, I, you know, I went through a time like that or whatever, you know, um, both men and women. Um, and that's been gratifying, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, but because I think one of the reasons that I really wanted to make it was um, because I didn't think it was a solo experience. I mean, um, and it was built in part the script from um, other people's stories. Like, I, it's not just my story. Um, and of course, at the time, I said it was fiction because I didn't want the press to get onto me. But um, but there were other people's lives in there. I mean, that thing with all the photos spread out and dwelt on over and over again, that was someone else, that wasn't me. But, um, for example. So, um, and, and it's one of those things that sort of women's liberation and consciousness raising was about, if you like. It was to say, this isn't the personal, is political. You know, this is not just your experience. And that was why I was prepared, and. And I should thank Alison Tilson as well for this because she was one of the people who said, you know, don't pull back, go there, you know, like, right. d don't censor yourself and try and make it all, you know, go, 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 go right so. there. <laughs> and um, it, it was part of that politics of the time, but I still think it's extremely important that um, you do put that out there so that the people who are feeling like that don't feel alone, you know. Um, that if they're not there going, oh, I'm mad, I'm crazy. I find it interesting the way gaslighting has become a term mm -hmm. um, since that film was made, not, not because that film was made, I think, but it's very interesting how that women's Me Too movement, etc., is now using that term. And those of you who have never watched Gaslight, watch it. Barbara says that in this state you don't know if you've done it to yourself and therefore you're a masochist or if they're all bastards and they're doing it to you. I imagine you as the man in Gaslight. He is trying to drive her mad. She loves him and takes a long time to realise that he is bad. She thinks she is mad. He wants her to think she is mad. That it is because she is mad that he doesn't love her. Steve. Did I drive you to cruelty, or am I imagining that you are cruel? And who is mad? I think it's important, uh, Virginia mentioned Jan McCoomish, because I was visiting Jan quite a lot at that point, and she write, she's writing a gap in the records. That's right, she is. Uh, yeah. And you... Uh, I'm referring to her not being home. Well, no, yeah, but, but you're also <laughs> in the next flat. Yeah. Beginning, uh, I, think, I think this is quite early. Uh, in my head it's 82, but I mean... The film was made in 86, but the actual well, living was really there was earlier, yeah. yeah all right. Uh, but, the, but you and Jam and I and someone else were already talking Talking about the film? Yeah. Oh. I may have collapsed 82 and eight when I come back to Sydney in 85, but uh, I might have squeezed the time to pray. But it, what I, where I was heading was that Al, you had Alison Tilson in common. Ah, oh, true, that's right. In the that's sense that Alison had been uh, co-editor of Frictions, yeah. Jan was in Frictions. Yes, uh, yes. And then... Uh, <laughs> Alison works. Uh, yeah, I think I must have met Alison because of Jan. And what I'm getting at was, was yeah. that there was a, both a feminist set of writing practices that were very strong in Sydney at, at that time, as well as a set of and filmmaking practices and cre creation generally. And and at that point, this, which has sort of come up in the discussion, there wasn't a single feminist voice. It was a multiple. 
Oh. Uh, you know, because it's when when post-structuralism comes in, when French feminism comes in. Uh, you're, you're quoting Bart. I could probably my problem, but I could smell uh, Derrida in the background. <laughs> um, you know, there, yeah. there was a, a huge creative ferment, yeah. uh, and the flats in, embody one aspect of it. Is, is yeah. what I was trying to get at. But are yeah. oh, you right? Yeah. Um, <coughs> but I w when you say there wasn't a singular film filmmaking voice you're suggesting that sort of things like For Love or Money were all collectively made films that... Um, well, I, I wasn't well, they were issue the filmmakers. When I was talking. Feminism itself was multiple, uh -huh. is all I was... Uh, but what do you mean when you say it's multiple? <laughs> well, you, you did an example of it when you said that the, the, the problem with the uh, role modelling account of liberal... Oh, right. You know, that's Thanks. one version mm. of feminism. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Okay. And in, in Melbourne, a lot of those, a lot of that debate took place around Lip Magazine, right. which had its editorial meetings at the Co-op, for example. Oh, okay. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say one other thing about about that voiceover. Yeah. That, uh, where any one of us is making, we're, we're enunciating, we're speaking something to be true, we know to be true, mm. and we're saying so. There are different how shall I put it, tones in which this can be said. Uh, one of these tones is the tone of discovery, something I have just found out to be true. And that uh, will, you can feel a different energy in my voice from when I make a statement, something that I've known for years to be true, etc. So what was happening here that I found so interesting was that the, the, the content of so many things that the voiceover said were uh, discoveries of truth. But the tone of voice that the actor was using was the tone of, I know this to be true, I'm simply referring you uh, to something I know to be true. Uh, and that's, that actually creates its own kind of tension. It's, it's, it's a form of, I, I hate to say, I use this word because I know it means something else to some film buffs, mm -hmm. but it, it's a form of intellectual montage. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually two processes going on at the same time in the same words. Okay. I'm going to have to dwell on that, John. I mean, trying to think, remember how I directed Jenny, because um, I'd written, you know, pretty, well, I'd written or I was quoting someone every word of the script and I knew it pretty well. Um, and some of it was, you know, mother's letters or my diary jottings or whatever. Um, I mean, we did the standard thing you do with method acting, really, which is what Jenny wanted to do. You know, what does this mean? Why are you saying that? You know, what's the intent of this? Who is it, who is it addressed to? Um, anyway, but that's how we worked. I almost knew I had lost Steve when I first fell in love. I remember when he fell. He fell first. He was mainly scared. He was stunned by the depth of his feeling. Later on, he was scared of how I could unleash his temper. It reminded him of the uncontrollable rages of his youth, times like when he locked his little brother out of the house. Scared of love and hate. He thought I would leave him. Mother-like, I took on that fear for myself. I read that voice as uh, that, that um, contradiction, if you like, that John's pointing out in the relationship between the content and the performance yeah. of the voice as a strategy, yes, which was to do with um, a distanciation of, of refusing to go with an empathetic articulation yeah. of an emotion, of a psychological state, but rather insisting on <coughs> a certain distance that allowed a critique. That's I'd what, I, that's what I thought the performance was doing. I'd agree with that. <laughs> like you, the, you the moments that I cringe yeah. the most is when she is going, you know, emotionally into it. And there's only a few moments. Um, there's only a few words, really, even, I noticed today. But, um, no, I always wanted it to be a bit what I would call pulled back, and you'd call, dis well, I'd call it too, distantiated. You know, like, I Stylized. I didn't want to, her to be dripping with emotion, that's for sure. Yeah. 
The mother is another there's, there's Anyway, sorry. Else. <laughs> yeah. um, there's something else about the voice over too, which is the actual intimacy of the relationship of the microphone to her voice. Can you tell us how that worked? Well, Elizabeth may remember better than me, but I'm pretty sure she was mic close. Uh, were you in a booth? Were you in a no, we weren't in a booth. We were in a, in a recording studio room. As big as this? As big as this, yeah. And but we Elizabeth and I were sort of like sitting there, mm -hmm. and Jenny was like sitting there with the mic close to her mouth. Mm -hmm. And was she? And she was sitting. Because the reason I'm asking is she that was sitting, wasn't yeah, she? Because there's something very settled about her performance. Mm -hmm. It's it's very it's like she's like a lot of what John's saying. But there's um, well, you know from Baxter and me, there's there's some there's a, a step that performers take where they go beyond the page, you know, they step up to it in mm. the performance. There's something about that performance with Jenny's that is very centred. Mm. Um, you wonder if that was it, the physical sitting. Yeah, sometimes it is. It's a lovely list from Jarell Road. Is that the other one of these that has that beautiful voiceover? Which and, one? Sorry. Um, lovely list from Tarelga Road. Tarelga Road. Yeah. Yeah. And he tried everything Stephen professional Rose. to do that, and eventually he asked him to sit on the bed and just hang on to the microphone. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. And just do yeah. it clean that way. So, but there is a beautiful quality to the actual recording itself. Yeah. Mm. Standing on the outside Don't know where I'm going to But I do know just one thing And that is it's over with you Blind Freddy knew that Blind man could see I was in love with you, and you weren't in love with me. One, or two one more of the questions. things we're talking about, those block of flats, that really struck me right from the start, mm. and I think there's a line about the view. Yeah, hoping and, the view um, would pull me out of the misery, yeah. That that character could never afford to live in that flat no. now. They <laughs> have cheap as cheap, as cheap at I the know. time. And, mm. um, and just trying to think about what that means for... Then we have cockroaches everywhere. That's Sydney for you. Yeah, well, no, that, that, that block of flats is actually still there. Um, and I think it's still operating as a block of flats. And they're very tiny flats. Yeah. Like, they're bed sits, essentially. They were exactly bed sits. Um, so, it'd be interesting to know what they could charge for them. Yeah. And they don't, didn't all have those views either. Yeah. Only the ones on that side of the house had those views. You know, the rest had suburban glebe views. Um, and we had a huge lemongrass growing in the front. And we had a huge kumquat tree, the hugest ever. But yeah. I just wanted to say something again, basically thinking again about the voice. Yeah. Um, when you just said then about how tiny the flats are, oh. the, and I think you know, you know that, I think it's a very kind of interesting and distanciation of time past or being in the present is a relevant joke, but the fact that your story is told as if we're in the flat with this woman in the time of it, mm. you know, we know at the start of it, his photo's on the wall, by the end it's gone, so it's a place she's living in, and yet her voice over quality is not in the flat, mm -hmm. it floats, it floats mm. you know, yeah, yeah. around yeah. and above mm -hmm. it or something. And that in itself is a, you know, interesting narrative device emotionally. Mm -hmm. For someone who's in such emotional turmoil, yeah, yeah. to have the voice not be in the same physical space. Yeah. As as, well, it's as if written on the page in a reflective moment, you know, mm -hmm. like I think, I think it's really interesting. I'm oh, sorry. Go on, Nicola. No, no, like it's not. There's no question to it. Yeah. Really, it's just one more thing to say. Well, about what I was going to say is this is the best discussion that we've ever had about the voiceover mm. <laughs> of the film, and the discussion's gone in a whole other direction from any other discussion I've ever had about the film, and I've learned things that I didn't know about the film from the discussion. Yeah. Mm.
Well, that's good. Shall we continue the discussion over a drink? Yeah. It might get And better. please, please um, come and have a drink with us. You're all welcome, whether you know me or not. Thank <laughs> you very much for coming. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John.